Ooh, that happened a lot faster than it normally does. What's going on, boys? Today we're talking about interior decoration. Let's make it clear, we are not doing interior decoration. We will never be doing interior decoration. However, I do want to analyze thinking about it. It's been on my mind since I was at least 10 years old because I remember making home movies with a friend in the fourth and fifth grade. And on that camcorder, what I didn't remember was a long conversation about it. And that's one of the things I've been thinking about lately. Not just interior decoration, but the progression of thinking about interior decoration. I'm sure everyone's starts differently, but thinking about the progression, mine started with lose-lose scenarios. I spent most of my childhood trying to figure out ways to connect with my father, and there are a few key moments indicating no matter what you do, that's not going to happen. Doesn't matter how well you argue, how much you can back yourself up with evidence. It doesn't matter how many self-help books you read, books about communication. Doesn't matter the things you try to talk about or aspire toward. It's not going to happen. I try not to talk too much about my father these days because nothing good ever comes of it, but I need to establish the foundation. Mainly because while lose-lose situations are stressful for anyone, at any time, I've found my reactions to even the smallest ones are extreme. And after a piss and a think, neither of which you were subjected to, removing the video away from what was going to be a bunch of complaining, back on target. When I was a kid, all my ideas about interior decoration were external. Fuck you for putting me in these lose-lose situations. I will paint this wall thoroughly. And all my time thinking would be about other people. Why they made this happen, how they would respond, that sort of thing. When I started drinking, the thinking pattern changed. Then it was focused on the problems and how long I believed I would be able to manage them until they became unmanageable. If there were a word for childhood thinking about interior decoration, it would be reaction. The word for drinking era interior decoration thinking would be running. I worked as a laborer at a printing press and realized this was not a life that was going anywhere, that was going to be worth living. So I fled into education, community college. But that's what it was. It was running. The only thing on my mind, or things on my mind, were how long am I going to be able to keep this up and what if anything, can I do to fix it before time runs out? And the longer I was in education, the more I drank, the more I tried, and the more pressure built up. But as we progress, keep trying to fix things in the back of your mind because it will become important later. Each year that went by made the rope feel tighter. I haven't figured out how to fix this, and although I'm trying, I'm doing a lot more drinking and running. And it got mentally and physically weird. I would cut different parts of my body so I would hurt lying down, I would hurt showering, I would hurt sweating, I would hurt eating different things. Anything discreet I could do that would make me aware of something. And I would cut gendered slurs onto my stomach. And the thinking about interior decoration during this time would be 
running, knowing you're not fast enough. It felt like an inevitability I was terrified of, and praying anything would get me away from it, make me not have to run, make it not inevitable. Now, post-drinking era was a lot of fear and caution. There were a few moments early on I would burn myself with cigarettes, but I stopped that pretty quickly. People are allowed to make you get naked in front of them and turn around like a good boy, so you cannot take that risk. And that fear and risk progressed into the thinking. You cannot even think about these things because thinking about them is a risk. But that wasn't the only thing that was different. Therapy helped until my health insurance stopped covering it, but the main benefit was proof that I was sane. Lose-lose situations are shitty. And although I was in education still, it didn't feel like I was running from a rope, at least not completely. In a different place with a different state of mind, a situation in which the seeds you planted are beginning to sprout a little bit, you can start to think a little bit about actual interior decoration and other fun things, not euphemism interior decoration. The trouble is, in education, you're in a bit of a fantasy land. And just because your mindset is more receptive to enjoying that fantasy, and it is just your mindset, and it is a fantasy, that doesn't mean anything really has changed. And since I've been back home, I've been thinking about a lot of things. Whenever I feel bad, I will analyze that feeling, adjust my thinking, and come up with a set of beliefs that will make me feel better. Again, nothing has changed the way you're thinking about them has. And that's a neat ability, but your circumstances have not changed. Reality hasn't changed. In fact, reality is the same now as it was before, and the way before before, all the way back into childhood. The things that don't work will continue not to work, no matter how you label them. And coming up with a solid set of beliefs can make you feel better for a little while, but all that's changed is how you're looking at things. Let's say you hate eating squash. It's disgusting, it makes you nauseous. You can read a book on why squash is the best food for people to eat. You can listen to people tell you squash is the best food to eat. You can gussy it up with spices you like. And maybe you can even bear eating it a while, telling yourself squash is the best thing to eat. Maybe you'll even enjoy it a little bit. But, at some point, your positive thinking, or your current critical theory of happiness, will not stand up to reality. If squash makes you nauseous, eating squash will make you nauseous. You're driving a car through muddy quicksand. All changing your thinking does and by extension your actions might I add all you're doing is changing gears your car might shake around, it might act different, it might sound different you might get a little bit of different grip here or there but you're still sinking I have cycled through so many different completely different theories on happiness and value in life lately. And when I say theory, I mean literary theory. 
how can I adjust my lens to make this look better, to make it make sense, and then to produce results, it's staggering. I'd be proud of myself if I'd gotten anywhere. My latest theory was one I was, am, most proud of, because under... It's almost foolproof. Humans have been telling stories forever. We have been thinking in stories so long, we cannot think, we can't structure our minds outside a narrative structure. Your political beliefs are a story. Your personal history is a story. History history is a story. When you want to be entertained, you seek out stories. When you want to entertain other people, you tell them stories. When you do things, a large reason why they're enjoyable is you're able to tell them later as stories. Everything in our lives is a story. Therefore, if you look at everything in your life, in your past, in your present, and then in your future, what you could do as stories you can't lose. No matter what your past is, you can tell it as a story for your enjoyment, for others' enjoyment, or even for profit. In your present, you're never bored. You always have something to think about. What story can you tell this person for fun or whatever? What story can you hear from them to learn something, to enjoy yourselves? Would this thing you're doing make a good story? Or if you're an author, can you take elements from this and incorporate it into a story you'll write? And then, for the future, you have years and years of stories to enjoy. And if you're afraid of something or you don't want to do something, maybe you'd do it anyway. Because no matter what happens, it will make a good story. That entire theory puts a positive, productive, creative spin on life and manages to marry past, present, and future in a way that makes sense. You get to enjoy all of them together. In terms of a way to look at life and make it positive, make it valuable at every step, that theory is perfect. In fact, if your thinking patterns are like a build in a game, that's the build I'm currently running because it's so effective. Turn bad history into something useful, enhance your enjoyment of what you have, and take even more risks because you know whatever happens will turn into something useful. All that said, not one single theory changes reality. Squash still makes you nauseous. Your car is still sinking in muddy quicksand. Thinking about human nature differently does not change human nature. You don't change reality. Reality changes itself according to something, and you either conform or you don't. Nothing changes reality. And to be completely clear, because I know fucking dummies aren't going to be able to follow, taking more or better actions does not change reality's topography. Shit is always going to smell like shit. And if you like eating shit, I'm happy for you. Personally, it's always going to make me sick. The word for this era is reflection. Both mirror reflection and self-reflection. To reiterate, we are not interior decorating. I hadn't thought about interior decoration for a while, but it struck me today, and it took a form I've never seen it, which is why I'm talking about it. We are reflecting on it. 
I encountered the minorest but purest lose-lose situation involving family. And it reiterated the truth. People are not rational or reasonable. If someone wants to hurt you in any way, they are going to hurt you no matter what you say or do. I tend to have a long, long fuse. It takes a lot to get me irrationally angry. And in this situation, this itty-bitty lose-lose situation sent me from zero to six thousand. It happened because I paid for a meal. Didn't know that at first. Assumed I didn't pay. So I'm a leech and a failure and a piece of shit. Finds out I did pay for it. Then I'm a shitty self-centered relative for not letting people treat me. I didn't openly lose my shit but that sort of thing has always happened, continues to happen, and will always happen. If someone doesn't like you, they will find a way to attack you, no matter what. That is never, ever changing. So I'm driving, and then interior decoration, for the first time in a long time, hits me and it comes in a completely different form from what I'm used to. Firstly, it points out the fact reality doesn't change. Even if you develop a hyper-effective theory and strategy and manage to get by, shit still smells like shit. Stories and narratives. If life is a series of stories, you have nothing but reruns to look forward to. You can change the setting and recontextualize things a bit. Maybe your future stories will have a bit more history behind them. Well, you don't really have a choice in that. But they're going to be essentially the same. I was thinking about serfs. How many of them lived their entire lives within a 50 mile radius. The classics. Or better, the Pompeii Graffiti. We are still doing and thinking about the exact same things. 2,000 years later, humans have made zero internal progress as a species. Or child laborers. The way someone can spend their entire life working in a factory. At the printing press, I worked with someone similar to that. That dude started working at that press when he was a teenager. He's almost 60 now. He has been a manual laborer the entire time. Considering reality isn't going to change, humans aren't going to change, do you think your stories when you're 60 are going to be better more worth experiencing than the ones you have right now. I don't know, but we have precedent for reality and humans not changing. If shit stinks now, it's, it's going to stink until you die. More, though, are the good stories you have better than the bad stories you have and do you think your stories are going to improve dramatically over time the good stories you have do you think you're going to have many of them and do you think they're going to be any better than the ones you've already had compared against the bad stories the bad reruns you will have not if, will. What was different about this strain of interior decoration was it had nothing to do 
with thinking about other people because there's nothing to think about. It had nothing to do with whether or not you can bear or weather life. You can. It was, do you want to see a bunch of beginnings and endings you won't like and then it's over then or do you want everything to be over now? If you choose not to refurbish your home, you are going to see and feel a bunch of things that hurt really bad. And you're seeing and feeling them for the chance, the small chance, of a few uplifting stories. But you'll know they're happening in spite of reality, not because of it. And for that reason, they are not going to last. And even if you have some of the best stories ever, they are still just stories. Or you can say fuck it and be done now. Blink of an eye. You won't have to endure impossible situations ever again. And when I wrapped my head around that, all I was thinking about was hell. And this was another reason this strain of interior decoration was strange. I am certain of my faith in observations. I walk around with certainty in my limited conception of God. Meaning, I have no idea what's going on, but there is something, maybe a few somethings, they have a purpose, and they make things happen and lead people around to that end. I don't believe in any set, organized religion. However, when I think about interior decoration, I am terrified of Old Testament Christian hell. There's a passage in Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man about hell that goes on for pages and pages and pages, if I'm remembering it correctly. If it didn't go on for pages and pages and pages, it sure as hell felt like pages and pages and pages. And I was trying to spiritual intuition my way into figuring out whether or not that hell exists. I don't know what the word for it is. I think genre... Genre is a stupid word once you learn how it works in industry stuff. So that isn't the word, but that's probably as close as we'll come. There is a genre of music, of art, of writing, of thinking, all these different things that don't seem connected, but are, that considers all this stuff in a strikingly similar way when you'd think they all together wouldn't. And there is one piece of shaky, maybe not shaky, I don't know what to think about it yet, precedent against hell. And that is, can you remember before you were born? No, of course you can't. You didn't exist. And that put me in a weird spot, because while that doesn't completely rule out hell, it does a bit, yet, if that's the case, then that would mean my conception of God also doesn't have some kind of afterlife for its followers. And there are two points attached to that. Firstly, with my conception of God, that would actually make complete sense. At no point in my idea of what God is, is there ever a guaranteed anything other than it has a purpose and you are part or a mechanic of fulfilling that purpose. And two, trying to reason through this at a human level is pointless 
but it also feels like something that's supposed to happen. Right now, I'm going to say that feels so warmly reptilian, it's liberating. Everything is intentional, and you're not going to get dragged along if you don't want to. I had a hard time choosing between and or but there. Essentially, the line of thinking became, do you want to put up with impossible situations for however long and then play Russian Roulette, or do you want to play American Roulette and then Russian Roulette right now? And that line of thinking fascinated me while I was in it because interior decoration had never gone to or gone into what felt like a closed room and a theology analysis before. Before, in both previous eras, thinking about interior decoration involved millions of different things outside and how you feel about them. This one was different. Everything was converging on one point. And it didn't feel like a reaction. It didn't feel like running. It felt like reflecting on whether or not to call a bluff. It was calm. It felt like trying to line things up not break them or hide from them. Now, third time, we are not interior redecorating. We will never interior redecorate. Intense emotions produced an interesting and calming train of thought I hadn't considered or analyzed before. And it was interesting to me enough I wanted to discuss it. Everything is dandy. Don't cause me problems and live in a cliché. But that about rippity wraps this one up. I hope you enjoyed watching because I certainly enjoyed making it. And I did. Normally, you aren't allowed to discuss these things. But... I cannot get over... How... Weird this line of thinking was, and I really wanted to discuss it. Like if you enjoyed, because it helps me out a lot. Subscribe if you haven't, because we do this shit sometimes, and comment your thoughts, because I love hearing from you. I don't know what to ask this time. Thanks again for watching everybody. Really, we have a lot of fun on this channel. So much fun, in fact, you can sprinkle it over some shitty drive through pizza. That ended up being pretty good. That's all we have on this channel, and I look forward to doing this with you guys again in the future.